Hey, so the Dub Talk podcast contains language and content that may not be suitable for younger audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individuals that speak them and do not reflect upon the other members. This episode is going to contain spoilers for Hanebato up to episode 8. They might also mention another relevant anime and drop spoilers for that too. So if that's not something you want to hear, maybe don't listen to this. Cool. Enjoy the podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Sports Talk, the podcast that discusses the latest and greatest in anime dubs. Yes, that's right, sports fans. The season of sports is in full swing, and with it, sports anime. I'm Stephen A. Starr, and joining me here at Sports Center are Hardy. Yes, yes, I'm not doing the Howard Cosell impersonation this time. That's for another episode. Good. Lack. I guess I'm not doing mine then. So. And the Spartan himself, Andrew. Hey, ladies. You want to take a look at my shuttlecock? Oh, oh. my. <laughs> oh, we're not even one minute into this. <laughs> it's, look, is that how you do Is that how you do your smash cut? <laughs> ah, speaking of smashing. Man, just who at the conception of the game of badminton thought that the name of the... It's not even really a ball... The instrument. The instrument should be called Shuttlecock. Like. I thought it was called a birdie. Birdie's like the nickname for it. Or it's. Oh, okay. It's technically called a Shuttlecock. Hmm. Okay, then. Anyway, tonight's a rarity for us here at Dub Talk headquarters. As we are underway to our summer lineup, we will be covering the dub of Hanabado, otherwise known as the badminton play of Ayano Hanasaki. Brought to you by Leiden Films. Yes, that's right. They're the same people who brought you the heroic Legend of Oslid reboot, Terraformers, and Yamada Kun the Seven Witches. This show looks a lot better than those other shows. Yes, they it also, does. Quite they a bit. also worked on the Golden Ark movies just a little bit. So. Oh, okay. The, the statement still stands. This looks a, bit, a lot better than a lot of those other things. Right. I like yeah. the Golden Ark movies personally but you know. <laughs> this is also like a tv budget so yeah, yeah. so and really a... really good animation god damn the show looks really good very good yeah it's like and... the, the uh the uh, uh every time i, I always uh, get stage fright the rotoscoping that's what I was thinking. The rotoscoping is really cool. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of these that look really realistic motions in regards to playing some of these practice games, and some of these matches look really uncanny. Like it's it's impressive. And, and it's, I also like the fact that they didn't resort to really janky CGI in order to help them out with the animation quality. Yes. Right. Thank okay. God. I, there are a yes. couple of times I did notice. There, there's some noticeable. I, there's a couple of moments. I think the most noticeable one I think was like somebody's hand looking at a CG shuttlecock, and I see the hand moves kind of like it's cell shaded CG. It's in a couple of spots, but not enough. Like I think most of the actual like game itself is actually hand animated, and it's, it's pretty impressive. It's few far between those moments. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, they, this is this is them knowing where they should have used CG. So, More or less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what is this I mean, show about outside of looking really good? Outside of looking really good, here's a quick synopsis. Despite her great potential, Ayano Hanasaki would rather avoid badminton than play. But when she meets Nagisa Aragaki, a third year who spends every waking moment perfecting her game, she's inspired. Encouraged by the coach Kentaro Tachibana, Ayano and Nagisa will hit the court and value against rivals with their amazing skills. So yeah, um, let's see. If you've seen a shonen sports anime, or if you've seen ping pong, or if you've seen like Prince of Tennis, or if you've seen, I don't know, just name a sports anime. This is like a manly aim for the ace. A manly aim for the ace. I'm not sure what aim for the ace is. Starring an entire female cast. Yeah, it was a... Well, no. Aim for the Ace was a female. Oh. Well. 
So th- it was it's a- not a manly version. It's a shonen version, I think, would be the yeah. more applicable uh, term. Okay. With a lot more vindictiveness, I'll tell you much. Yeah. Mm. Okay, then. So, now nah, we will be discussing our predictions for the dub, who was actually cast, and give our thoughts on the performances. So, I hope y'all are ready to get your badminton on. As always, as always, we start with the ADR director and scriptwriter. So, who would like to go first? Hmm. Well, you know, I don't usually make predictions for ADR scriptwriters, so I'm pass. I'm passing. What about the I, director? I already said ADR. Oh, I thought I, th- I heard ADR scriptwriter. I got confused. Okay. Mm. Okay, you want to go first, Andrew? Uh, I was gonna say I had two people in mind in regards to who I thought would be a good fit for this. One is because I've seen him do like a similar sports series before, but that is very different tonally than this, so it would have been interesting to hear Clifford Chapin do a sports drama, and also I thought Jade Saxton would have been a really good fit, since she's really good with a lot of character-driven stuff that I think are sometimes a little more like females l centric cast, so I thought she would have been a good fit for this as well. Okay, you have A for scriptwriter? No? Uh, I, I don't really predict a lot of the scriptwriter stuff. It's most of the time, it's just whoever does this, I hope they make it sound good. Uh, and then I'm taking it back. You have no predictions? No. <laughs> All right, fine. So, as for me, I'm, I'm going to start with my scriptwriter first. I had three for each. I had Bonnie. Clinky Beard, I had Caitlin Barr, and I had Samuel Woody because all three of them have written sports dramas before. Well, some of them were sports dramas, others were like dramedies, if you think about it. I mean, like, every. Th- what do you mean, like, dramedies? Well, in Caitlin Barr's case, Q. Oh, yeah, she did do Q. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. That. Well, that's. Basically, it's sports shonen at the end of the day. It's like there's comedy, there's drama. Yeah. Okay. Okay. As for directors, I had Jeremy Irvin because I thought this might be right up his alley. You know, something about you know, being a tough guy. I thought maybe he'd be into the sports thing. And I had Tia Ballard because I know this is probably something she'd love to work on. I know she's very into sports. I also had a, a pseudo pick in uh, Kyle Phillips because I was I was hoping to put him down at first. That I remembered Overlord was a thing. I mean, so, to be to be fair, like they've kind of shown that like directors can handle more than one show at a time. Yeah, to which he is actually one of the ADR directors. Ooh, yeah, there's two of them. Uh, our scriptwriter is uh, Clayton Browning, but our main ADR director is Tabitha Ray. Hmm. This is a surprise to me. What have they done before, Jamal? So, in Tabitha Ray's case, uh, she's directed our Dancing with the Dragons and Suri Dury Children. Ooh, Suri Dury is a good one. Mm, but she's also, she's also helped out with... Uh, Assistant is Kado the Right Answer and Kido Straight the Beautiful World. Kyle Phillips, he's directed uh, Hida Matsuri, the Overlord franchise, and episode 23 of All Out. Clayton Browning here, he's written four episodes of Dog in the Franks, a couple episodes of Joker Game, Kankole, and Legend of the Galactic Heroes, the new thesis. De Noia Tessa. Is that how you say it? He, yes, De Noia Tessa, because the... It, it's German, I know, but... They, they pronounce don't, don't. it at the end of every episode, De Noia Tessa. Don't, I, don't feel I, bad. Don't feel bad, Jamal. I hosted that episode, and I still... Don't. I, I saw that episode. No, just I'm behind a few episodes on that, so... I, no, I'm it sorry. doesn't sound like something that's behind. It sounds like something they do at the end of every episode. I've yet to watch the show, so I'm not one mm-hmm. to talk. I just did not know how that was how it said. Thank you, Hardy. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so Hardy, would you like to take it here? I mean, take it away. Oh, it's me? <laughs> would oh, you like okay. to yeah. be the first serve, if you will? Sh- sure. <laughs> Shut up, Andrew. <laughs> Deny it, Tessa. 
You went into a show. You went into a Unterleben, sport. Globen. You went into a sport about shuttlecocks, not expecting I was going to be obnoxious tonight. Come the fuck on. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll get started. Okay. All right. Um. Yeah. Uh. I think direction on this series has been very solid, and it is a definite improvement. Um. Tabitha Ray is showing that she is. Definitely improving as a director because I I do have a confession to make. I thought Dances with the Dragons was not a very good dub at all. It had a lot of serious problems, a lot of inconsistent acting, and just it, it was it felt more like an experiment. I, I I know we don't like to use this phrase around very often, but it was very much it did very much feel to me like a training wheels dub. Okay. Yeah, but this is a marked improvement, and to see her go from an experiment like Dances with the Dragons to a very well-written, well-directed, and well-performed dub uh, such as Hanebado is is definite praise in my praise for her in my part. So I think everything was well done. It was well written too. There's not a whole lot of slang or uh, or what do you call it? Um, buzz words thrown about very consistent and uh and enjoyable so i think you're it's a forgetting smash in a, my hit you're forgetting a certain somebody oh well, yeah it's there's also some loser who works on it but you know no we don't talk about him much so you, you want to bring that up or you want to save that for later <laughs> yeah kyle phillips and i you know have a sort of a friendly rivalry now <laughs> Because I actually well, got to, I actually got to meet him in Dallas, and he called me out. He's like, "You don't like me very much," and, I'm, and uh, so yeah. So now we uh, we joke around each other about each other on Twitter, and uh, and I um, have I'll, developed I'll, this sort of rivalry with him now. So. I like the idea that like you're not even like a serious rival to him. You're just kind of like. You're like the evil in that one DC counting books where you're like Lex Luthor that stole yeah, I 40 stole cakes. I stole 40 cakes. And that's right. te- that's that's as much as four tens, it's, and it's that's terrible. Of yeah, Marvel. it's like I stole the last beer from the fridge and left the faucet running when I brushed my teeth. <laughs> just, just imagine Kenshiro with a handlebar mustache. That's Spaceman Hardy. <laughs> I can't unsee it now. Uh, I'm trying you put a new that look. Image on? <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> I need to get that commission. Uh, this is going to be one of those nights now. Yeah, but anyways, no. They, I, I have no ill will towards Kyle Phillips. I think he's a respectable director, and I think he did a very good job on this show alongside Tabitha Ray. So. Yeah. So Tabitha Ray obviously is not one. Not a name I really talk about often, mostly as an assistant director, but as a full director, I think she did a pretty good job here, especially with the casting, because I know I've seen the majority of Surrey Dirty Children, and I was surprised how she handled that very well. That's it with the dragons, yeah, it does seem kind of experimental, but that's because of the show itself. I only watch for two characters, but that's it. Uh, Other than that, you it's pretty much a pass, but she did a very good job here. Kyle Phillips, well, I've put like Megan, I've pretty much come around on Kyle Phillips lately. I mean, he the Matsuri, Gage, and Magus, but he's been doing pretty well. I know he he did the Italian episode too, and episode two was very dramatic, and we'll talk about that with a few characters later on, but he manages to keep the tone of the show very well, and the tone of the Tapethus work. Clayton Browning, I I really can't find any fault with his writing so far. It's, it's been pretty solid. I I have no qualms here. Uh, Lack? Uh, well, as I've been saying in the chat, uh, I actually really love this dub. Yeah. Like, I, I am genuinely surprised how much I really like this dub. I feel like everyone was exceptionally well cast. I feel like they've all been delivering their lines like so well throughout this whole thing. And uh, the dialogue is actually really well written. Like you said, Hardy, it doesn't try to be kind of new age or anything like that. It really just... I, I mean, this is a series that kind of bases itself around, like, personal uh, anxieties and, and feelings of inadequacy. 
so trying to make the dialogue snappy and, and quirky just wouldn't feel right for this kind of series. So it's a really good choice to not have gone that route and try to really ground the dialogue and just try to make it feel like real people. Because in spite of the more crazy aspects of this series, I will say, it, it does stay fairly well grounded and it, it needs dialogue that stays grounded with it and it needs performances that stay grounded with it. And really the best part about this dub is how well that all comes together. Mm. That's how I feel. So. All right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, as for me, overall, yeah, I was pretty impressed with a lot of performances with this. Um, like I said, I've cut a... Kyle Phillips is a very interesting director where there's a couple of dubs where like, okay, this was okay, but in recent years, like, I've been very impressed with the stuff he's turned out to the point that I think the work he's done in past couple of shows he's done for Funimation have been exceptional. And I've, I real like I said, the only experience I have with Tabitha was Sure Dure Children, which I thought was a phenomenally hilarious show, like... God damn it, go so watch Suri Dura Children if you ever need a gut busting laugh. Like Yeah. <laughs> like here's here's the way I describe Suri Dura Children. Um Orange is high school students are stupid and it's it, it angers people. It's enraging. Whereas Suri Dura Children is high school students are stupid and it's hilarious. Oh god, it's these kids are so stupid, but I love all of these morons and I want them to all like find love. The fucking idiots. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, oh wait, no. She did some Aquino's journey too. I did watch some of that. I've not seen Dance with the, with Dragons, and everything I've heard don't. about that show sounds like yeah, exactly. I, I don't want to see it. But yeah. there's a lot of really. This is going for a much more like heavy sports drama vibe, like a bit of melodrama in that regard. But I think all the performances that are being given, like, when they're being very dramatic and heartfelt, or when they're just being a little absurd and goofy, like, I think all of the direction that they're being given really works. I think all the dialogue feels pretty, pretty balanced, and there's enough interesting, like, there's enough terminology that I believe that these people actually know the sport, but not to the point where it's like, I'm getting lost being like, okay, how the hell do I play this game again? But there's a lot of really natural, like, grunts and battles that they do. And overall, yeah, I'm pretty impressed with the direction and the script writing in regards to the dub of Hanabato. Good job all around. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, okay, consensus is pretty good here. No faults. Except for all the faults. How dare you? They're like, okay, I'm kidding. I thought you were going to try and make a bad bit of reference, but hey. So, we good to move on? Okay, I was going to say, you were just assuming it was a smash hit when it could have been a foul. Mm, I know most people are crying foul, but that's a different story. Mm. Nobody's hey. crying yet. Hey. I, I, for one, want to love this dub. Ah. Uh, I know it's a couple of our char next characters providing love to this dub. To the show in general, actually. We have uh, Yuebida, who's the who is uh, the member of Kitakobachi's badminton club. She's like a se she's a second year and she is adorable. Yeah, she's a bit of a foil most of the time, but... Uh, she's she a bit of a what? A com she, most times when you see in the show, she's a bit of a comedic foil, but she does get some dramatic moments too, especially episode two. Oh, okay. She's mostly like a supporting character, except yeah. for the stuff regarding her um, feelings. She's corndog girl. Yes. Girl Meets always the best after a workout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shut it, Andrew! <laughs> Shut it! Uh, she might, she uh, might like to share that corn dog with somebody else. <laughs> yeah, probably Miyako Tomo. Ah, fuck! Yo, I'm she's not hot for teacher. What's wrong with you? <laughs> okay. Miyako Taromaru. Yeah, pretty much just. 
She stated a Justic member of the club, the club advisor who knows next to nothing about badminton, but would do anything to support them. She's K- there because the club needs an advisor. Yeah. A bit, a bit upbeat at times. She also brings in uh, our secret weapon, who we'll get to later on in the show. Uh, yeah, so... In regards to predictions, have- I did not have any for these two... Can't wait, hang on. Do I have anything for these characters? Uh, I did not. I did not have anything for these characters. Well, I did. So I'll go ahead okay. and list mine. Okay, what'd you have? I went easy target um, for you. I went Sarah Wienhef. And because she reminds me a lot of the teacher from Free, I went with Caitlin Glass for Miyako. Makes sense. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, for you, I kind of had Ariel Graham because I wanted to see something different. And I really liked her performance in Hidematsuri, so I thought maybe she brought it here. As for Miyako, I had Kristen McGuire to your ballad because I figured Kristen McGuire, she could really bring that energy she usually has to these dubs, these kinds of dubs. And Tia, because I know she's a sporty person, I just want to see her enthusiasm here. But we're both wrong, Hardy. Well, so, so, what about you, Lack? Did you have any predictions? Uh, if I had one for you, it probably would be Jade Saxton. Mm, okay. 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 In any case, you is voiced by Law Woodhull. And Miyako is voiced by Caitlin Barr. La Woodhole, you've heard her in other roles such as Midori Morimoto from Keijo, Axel Nishigori from Yuyan Ice, Koshiri Onigashima from Shimaneta, and Claire from Princess Jellyfish. Also Baby Deku. Yes, Baby Deku too. Can't forget the baby. Uh, Caitlin Barr, you've heard her in other roles as Maya from Anime Gatteries, Mai Wataya from Chihaya Furu, Haruka from Haikyuu, and Hardy's personal favorite, Melda Dietz from Star Blazers 2199. Blue Waifu. Once you, go, once you go blue, that's all you'll ever do. Would you eat some of her parfait? I would totally eat some of her parfait. Good man, high five. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, yes, Melda's yes. Don't you judge us, Melda's hot. Yeah, well, Melda's hot. I know. I know. We. I know some of us like you. Leave my blueberry out of this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, we get. It. You want to stick your teeth into her, to her. So you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, yeah, I think they both did really well. Um, they don't really have much to do after the first two episodes, uh, but. Um, I think that Laura brings a certain really lively, a whole lot of liveliness to her character, uh, especially on the bus where she's doing everybody's hair and and trying to uh, get Yunakisa out of her slump. And uh, and yeah, she's just sort of like, I, I would say she's the moral compass of the group. Yeah. Yeah. And she sounds really good here. Um Caitlin as Miyako didn't really stand out to me all that much, other than being just like the uber hyper, really preppy teacher who's just excited, yet she knows exa- nothing about what she's doing. Um, but it wasn't a bad performance, and I think it was pretty good. So that's all I have to say here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really, I really like the energy that you breaks to this character. It's, yeah, she is the more compass, definitely. I mean, I know she has some moments later on, but. For right now, she did a pretty good job. I even like some of the one-liners she has. Like, when she's feeling up Iron legs, like, he legs have zero squish. I'm like, really? really Okay, you want to talk a big mood? That moment when she's, like, gripping onto her legs is like, oh, this feels so (laughs) nice. It's like, girl, you live in that dream. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And as for Caitlyn, it's like, why don't you brought up Caitlyn Glass, Hardy? Because I, I never really talked about Caitlyn Barr often before, but to me, she sounds like a cross between her and Mallory Roddick. And I, I thought... I know, right? Because I watched almost all of Katana Maidens thinking her character was Caitlyn Glass. Because huh. they sound a very, very similar in a lot of cases. 
Yeah, I, mean, I watch. I watch all of Anime Gatteries, and I thought. Wait, she who was she in Anime Gatteries? She was Minua's sister, the one with the glasses. Minua's sister. Oh, is she the sister of the main character? Yep. Okay, I okay, I forgot about her. All right. Yeah. So when I heard it here, I was like. Keep in mind, I did not see the press release before this because it wasn't up at the time, but I actually thought it was Kate the Glass. So I was like, okay. oh, of course. And then I see it's Kate the Bond. I was like, what? All right. But she but she handles that enthusiasm very well. I'd really love to hear more of it. Even if she doesn't get a lot of screen time, you know, at least you know it's kind of infectious in a way. Mm -hmm. At least they all look cute. So says the coach. I mean, the advisor. Okay. Luck. Okay. Uh, well, one thing that absolutely stood out for me, I loved Yu's voice. Honestly, I just love the way Laura Woodhall was able to sound like a young girl without just trying for a cutesy voice. That is something that really stood out for me, for you. I just, <clears throat> like, every time I heard you talk, I was like, this really does sound like a girl this age talking. Which can be a really hard thing to get right in anime. And I was super impressed, just, uh, again, how grounded she sounded. Like, like, it didn't sound like it was a put-on at all. It sounded like it was a real girl this age talking. And I was really genuinely impressed. Uh, for Miyako, I'm kind of in the same vein of, yeah, she didn't really have many scenes, but I thought Caitlin Barr did a great job with each one of the scenes that she was in. I especially love the, the uniform scene. I thought that was exceptionally well done. Yeah. I thought it was... I thought it was super fun, Nagisa getting embarrassed and all that, and I thought Caitlin Barr did a great job of playing Miyako for the scenes that she's been in. Okay. So. Okay, so, uh, yeah, Caitlin Barr, I'll, I'll start with first, because I'm pretty much exactly in the same boat where I think she does a very good job, and she feels like a very natural fit for this caring teacher who's a little unsure what to do, Partly because there's a lot of drama going on and she doesn't know how to handle it. And partly because she doesn't really know Jack Squad about the game. But she does know she wants her girls to look fashionable and cute. So she will make them get those outfits, goddammit. And she did a good job. Uh, Yu is probably one of my favorite side characters. Just because her energy and just her personality is so infectious. Infectious. She's just a very bright and cheery and the the energy that Laura gives her like makes me believe both that she is like this preppy cutesy person but also like she is genuine and emotional about certain things regarding the club and regarding her uh, very obvious crush on Alejandro Saab who we are not covering tonight but she has a crush on a guy voiced by Alejandro Saab even if the show has yet to outright say it. Um, but... Yeah. Also, one of my favorite things that I think she says that I made sure to write down is when they're on the bus and she's playing with their hair and she goes to, uh, uh, what's it? I, Iano's hair and her, the thing she whispers in her, ha in her ear, I am the painter and you are my canvas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. That lie <laughs> just, really that lie just killed me. I'm like, oh, that's so funny. And it just, I love, uh, and like, when they're playing cards together, it's like, read them and weep, babies! It's just, oh. Everything she said is just so funny, and she's just so fun. I love, I love what Laura's doing with uh, you, and it's great. She she is how you're supposed to write that character, hmm. basically. And she also is, like, genuinely unsure what to do, because she's kind of caught in the middle of a lot of stuff going on sometimes. Yeah. And she just... She's an, she's an awkward teenager, you know, so... Mm -hmm. And yeah, no, I, I, I liked what she did, and we're good to go. Okay, good, so we move on to the next stop now. We oh, have the, uh... oh, great, it's this bitch. <laughs> oh, this girl. Yes, oh. we move on to the training camp. Surprise, cap. bitch, I bet, <laughs> bet you thought you'd see the last of me. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, we move on to the training camp arc, where we encounter some... Members of the Federicia Girls High School. Anybody in the mood for pastries? Mm, I could go for a nice hot Danish. Uh, Speaking of hot... <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
That came out way more aggressive than I was expecting. <laughs> Oh. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Good lord! So hardy, you in the mood? You in the mood for some lemon flavor? Uh, oh god! Jesus Christ, Hardy! Yep. Hardy wants to sock in that lollipop. Uh, I take it to the candy shop <laughs> to have the lollipop. Okay, so who are we talking about again? Get thee to a nunnery, Hardy. Please. Yes, uh, the uh, Danish in question being, of course, Connie Christensen and her impulse control, Yuika Shiwahime. Her impulse control is pretty much like anybody that kind of tells her to suck like it. Like Hardy in that joke. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> she, she, You're just jealous you didn't think of it first. I'm... No. <sighs> Jesus Christ. God damn it. We do it. We're doing this again, aren't we? Man, I'm now. I'm now actually unironically really hungry for a Danish right now, and not. <laughs> okay, so you is Yuka. Uh, she's the she's the captain of the girls' school, right? Yep. Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Just want to make sure. Uh I don't think I had a prediction for the captain, but did I have? Predictions for you. You okay there? Yeah, I'll be okay. Okay. Oh, I, I do have predictions for Connie because when I, I watched the first two episodes and she had yet to appear, I just kind of made uh, two guest predictions. Uh, I thought either Monica Rial or Lucy Christensen, just because I was going off design and I wasn't sure what to expect. There's no sun at the end of it. Christian, okay, no, yeah, I see no, what you I, did I, there. Yeah, okay, I see what I, I did there. I see what there. you did there. That was un. Okay, Christian, okay. not Christian son. The character is Christian son. I don't even know if she's a Christian son. Stop asking me. <laughs> <laughs> she's a that sour Danish, that's for sure. Boy, uh, she is. She is a lemon in more ways than one. Okay, uh. Mm. Plenty of lemon fix it. <laughs> no, it's sorry. All right, I did not have predictions for either of these characters. I only watched the first couple episodes before they appear. So, mm-hmm. I had one for the captain and Madeline Morris, which is ironic because she shows up as another member later on. Okay. Uh, as for Connie. I had to you because, again, a sporty personality, uh, she could really break the character. We're going to say sporty had... a lot. Well, we've met to you, remember? Anyway, I had uh, <laughs> Brynn because I thought it would have been obvious casting, but also I wanted to see her do kind of a European accent again. Mm. Which, eh. boy, we'll get into that, okay. Uh, and because Holland is closer to Denmark, I copped out with Sir Wiedenheft. Holland? She's from Holland? Yeah. I, I, I thought her name was German. Isn't that weird? <laughs> is it, is it, how about no, you <laughs> crazy <Dutch> Dane bastard? <laughs> huh, I did not know she was from Holland. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I learned a thing. Cool. Like, would you like a schmuck and a pancake? <laughs> you like a you, you would be caught a gold member, Hardy. Oh boy, tonight this cigar this... and a waffle, bong and a blitz. <laughs> oh, this is this. Is... Now I have the strongest urge to listen to Ludacris after this. Jesus yeah. Christ! All right, Jamal, just, just just tell us. Okay, so for the team captain, she's voiced by Manu Radic, and for Cardi herself, she's voiced by Ariel Graham. Mallory Roddick, you've heard of another role such as Valkyrie Bikini Warriors, Earl Weiser in High School DxD Board and DxD Hero, Utica and Hidematsuri, Solution Epsilon in the Overlord franchise, and Yuki Boy in Uisha Iskandar Star Blazers 2199. Yuki. Ariel Graham is a new a- newer actress to Funimation, you've heard of as Mao and Hidematsuri, as Sakura and Kido's Journey to Beautiful World, and Tia and Overlords 2 and 3. Cool. 
Okay, I gotta be honest, Jamal. I kept hearing, instead of Mallory Roddick, I kept hearing Rami Malik, And I was like, what? I, is it Roddick or Rodick? I thought it was Rodick, I think it's Roddick. Okay. That is kind of a tennis joke. But I was just like, isn't he doing Bohemian Rhapsody? What is he doing in these dubs? I don't get it. <sighs> Hardy? Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? Okay, let's start off with the captain. Um, as you no doubt know, if you listen to our Star Blazers episode, uh, I originally was not the biggest fan of Mallory Roddick because she started off, well, she started off in Showman Sample, which is never a good syndication, but, uh, but I always just sort of thought she was missing something. But in Star Blazers, she had gotten to the point to where I was legitimately impressed with her work. And I think that's just carried on to here. I think every new role that she takes on, she gets she improves a little bit more. And uh, this is no exception. I think she went into the role, and I think she did a very, very respectable job. Let's get on to Connie. Mm. Because, boy, howdy, do I not like this character. She is a Jeez. piece of work. Oh, boy. Um, she's just... Part of the... One of the things I don't like about this show is they make Connie out to be this vindictive little snot. And then, at the end of the match, they try to... What's the word? Um, Make her empathetic? Em empathize with her. her. Yeah, humanize her just a little bit, you know, with the whole bath scene and everything. But, I mean, I don't think she really deserves to be empathized with after the way she treats um, Ayano. F just the cold-heartedness and just... God, this and one other character, and we'll get to her next, are just the most vindictive, vile pieces of trash... And and I don't like them. I don't like they're, them at all. They, they are very hardcore shonen antagonist types. You, you're absolutely right. The, the issue with the show is that it tends to write these really vile, vindictive characters. Mm -hmm. And it thinks that's okay without having some sort of, you know, reasoning behind it. I don't know. Maybe Connie does have some backstory that explains kind of her behavior. I mean... She was this prodigy. She is the favorite child of Ayano's mother. Mm. So, which I, I don't know. Man, I'll, yeah. I'll go to more later, but yeah, I do now, not care for the drama involving her mom at all. Yeah, maybe it'll straighten itself out by the end two episodes, which are delayed, unfortunately. But uh, wait, what? Yeah, the earthquake delayed the last oh, two episodes. Yeah. Oh shit! Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. for, in regards to episode but, eleven, more or less. It, it's yeah. it's it's also kind of interesting because from what I've seen, I, I could be completely wrong, and I don't mean to alienate any fans here because I actually like Hane Vado, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't seem like the manga is considered that well written of a series. I've actually told which is, that which the is... manga explains much more about what's actually Ooh. going on with the mom, like a lot better than the anime does. Uh, which, okay. which is ironic because Kai explained to us that the anime has definitely strayed from the manga to the point where I tried to find a description for this. All I could get was the manga description. Mm -hmm. It was vastly different than what I got here. Uh, but anyway, we'll discuss the mom later on. But uh, as far as Ariel's performance as Connie, it largely boils down to the same issue that I had with... Uh, Tini Tirado's performance in Tokyo Ghoul. And there's a lot of the same issues that I had watching DS Ray, which don't watch that, it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, is that yeah, she that uses the Danish accent, and I can't tell if it's authentic or not. That's the issue I have with accents, is not being around a lot of Danish people, I don't know how it's supposed to sound. I mean, can we listen to Ariel's performance and her accent that she uses for Connie and and say that it sounds good or or can we tell that it's um, a cheap imitation? I don't know. I think she definitely brings the energy to it. I think she definitely brings the, the sweet and the sour aspects of Connie's personality. Um, I think she definitely works on the emotional aspects. That part is admirable. Whether or not the accent... Um, 
is accurate, that is my only real hang-up. And that is a hang-up that I usually have with with um, accents in anime in general. You know, is this going to sound authentic? Can this pass, you know, for... And that's the only real hang-up I have with it. Um, Connie, as a character notwithstanding, I definitely think Ariel brings her all to the performance, and it's, it's, and it's an admirable job. All right. Okay, then. Mm-hmm. Uh, going off of that, I actually managed to look up how a Danish accent kind of sounds, and for the most part, Ariel was kind of on the mark, because I know that, yeah, I know certain accents, like, it, to me, it came down to whether I could still understand her with the accent or not, because I have, I have no problem with accents, but I, I thought Ariel was on the mark, especially with the performance, too. I found it a little odd at first because I'm not used to Ariel Grab as a voice actress yet. Like, but she's really she's slowly starting to come into her own. Maybe with more time, you know, she'll be even better. But for right now, it's okay. Uh, Mallory Roddick. The thing about Mallory Roddick is, to me, she usually has like kind of an air of arrogance to the voice. As I said, the Hida Matsuri episode, but for here, she managed to suppress it. And I, and I thought it worked very well. I was kind of surprised, because normally when you hear Mallory speak, it either sounds like it's a little too old for the character to decide, or it fits if she's played an adult character. Mm-hmm. So so I thought the two did pretty good. So. Uh, right. Lack? Lack? Uh, well. The funny thing is, for Connie, I was not expecting them to go that route. Honestly, well, I can understand, but you can't which, keep in mind which route, so- like the character or the accent. The the accent. Okay, okay. Honestly, well, because yeah, I understand, but you gotta keep in mind she's a foreign exchange student. Yeah, which, which, which is why, to I be had... fair, like the choice of an accent doesn't necessarily have to translate in like the voice. But it's just an interesting decision he's trying to say. Right. It's it's not that I honestly had a problem with it at all. Um, I, I do worry that it might have hindered Ariel's performance a little bit because I know that accent acting is not always the easiest thing and sometimes it can be hard to know how to sound proper and to act. So, But at the same time, I think Ariel Graham's performance was great. I thought she did a great job of the character. And yeah, I agree Connie's kind of a piece of shit, but I, I, I did... Like, I really thought Ariel gave it her all. Um, for Yuki, uh, for uh, Yukia, it's it's a little harder because, again, she's a character that doesn't really have much to do. Like, especially when she's playing second fiddle to Connie, like the rest of the, her team is. Um, it, it's it's just... Um, but I, I thought Mallory Ruddick did fine. Um, but, yeah... Connie is the far more interesting example here because of the fact that, first of all, she stands out because she's the only one with an accent. Okay. And uh, that that kind of makes her distinctive from the rest of the cast. And it's it's so funny, too, because we have two twin-tailed rivals, one yeah. after another. What do you like, lemon or strawberry? <laughs> For fuck's sake, Andrew. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I prefer the taste to be strawberry. That's just me. Do, do you do you want Japanese or Dane tonight? Um, but it's it is, and I think the accent actually does help differentiate them. Um, because I mean, for the Japanese, there is no accent, so it, it's so it, it makes it harder for us, like English listeners, to be able to differentiate the two characters. When both of them are just speaking Japanese in a Japanese accent. You know, hmm. whatever a Japanese accent is. But you get my point. Um, but yeah, ultimately both of the actresses here did a great job. And uh, they, they brought a lot of energy to their characters. And yeah, I really liked it. Okay, so uh, quickly, uh, I think Mallory does a very good job being the voice of reason and the leader of uh the frederica girl school i think it's called um and she she's very good she has a very soft-spoken voice but she's very civil and very sportsman-like 
which is really neat. Which is the exact opposite of Connie fucking Christensen. Jesus Christ. Man, um... So... Ariel... I'm... I think it was an interesting decision to give her an accent. I don't think it was a bad one. I think it was an interesting one. That being said... I feel like this must have been... F like, it feels like this was tricky. But this must have been... F fun to play this kind of a shithead like it just sounds like she is just taking that lollipop glazed and golden ham and just kind of crunching and munching and just having a freaking birdie man it's just it's so weird but it's a lot of fun and just like I feel like she was one Ojo-sama laugh away from going full 90s villain. <laughs> oh, God. Like, tell me you couldn't just see her just putting her hand on, in front of her face and just laughing. Like Karen Konzuki? Like Karen Konzuki, yeah. Except, yeah, okay. Yeah. B but, yeah, I, I think she's having a lot of fun. Also, maybe it's just me. She, like I said, I'm getting a lot of parallels to stuff like Kuriko's basketball. Or, honestly, in a weird way, I got a weird vibe to ping pong in regards to, of all characters, Kong Wenge. Like, in the, the grounds of the transfer student who is standoffish and naturally talented that gradually over time grows and bonds more with his teammates... I, I, I think that was done way better in ping pong, while this mm -hmm. is done with a bath scene, which... Yeah. Which was a choice. It's... I'm not gonna say if I liked it or disliked it, but it was a choice they made. But, yeah, um... To be fair, it's the only time this show's really done something like that. It's, it's mostly... Yeah, it sounds like... Well, honestly, it's, it also sounds like the anime is much more dramatic compared to, like, the early manga, from what I'm told. Yeah. Plus, when you compare it to Horror Count of Receive, it seems to be true. So. True, true, true. But, yeah, yeah uh, I I did not mind the accent. I thought it was actually a lot of fun and kind of interesting. But it was definitely yeah. a little jarring to get used to at first compared to the other show, the other parts mm -hmm. of the show. If, and, if I could just say one... Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say outside that, like, I, I don't care for this character much myself. But she was a lot of fun. I just she her whole deal is basically centered around the drama that is Ayano's mom, and I feel the drama around Ayano's mom is the weakest shit in the show. So that's kind of a. There's a lot of people who would rather see Nagisa be the main character. Yeah. God, I fucking would. This show oh. tricked me. Okay. Well, uh, can we? Can I just say one thing before we move on? Okay. What on earth is up with Connie's outfit in the second half? What is that? What is that thing what she's are those? wearing? Like it's a half leotard or something? I'm like, what is that? Wait, the second half, second half. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember yeah, myself. I, I don't think they've released... They've, they they teased the, her, the uh, Fredericia g girls' uh, new... Um, Outfits, outfits for the tournament and it's like it's like a half swimsuit almost and yet like half shorts and like one one thigh raises up it is like the weirdest looking thing yes yeah, guess that's how they do it in denmark <laughs> i guess it, well i mean they're not in denmark that's the thing maybe they want to le learn by their example we're not even in Denmark. <laughs> anyway. Anyways, I just needed to point that out. So, how much of the girls' school do you think has had a bit of Danish lemon tonight? Oh, boy. Oh, After that bat God. scene, I'm not sure. Probably all of it. <laughs> all right. This is going to be weird for a number of reasons. Let's, 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 let's move, move on. on. Let's move on. Yes, right. let's move on to the... Uh, it's funny, I had them as a trio, but I put them as a pair now. The worst of the worst. The oh, worst of the worst. Geez. I like... Geez. Okay. Okay, oh. so introduce the characters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have Kaoko Serigaya, 
and we have Uchika Shindo. Uh, Kaoko is uh, Ayano's childhood rival who's a uh, first year at Kodan High School. Uh, if you've seen the flashback to where they pretty much were pitted against each other, she decided to make things a fair fight by giving Ayano a cold, which probably could have killed her. Okay, so... I feel like that must have been, like, emphasized much harder in the anime. Because that this feels like a throwaway bit or, like, would not be that, like, a, a small gag. That they turned into, like, this very heavy, dramatic moment. And it was almost kind yeah. of fucked up the way they presented it. I, I, I don't think it was a gag. I think it was more of a psychological influence which led to Uchika here being a... Mother of the Year. Oh, the, like uh, ten-time national champion of Japan. Like, there's uh, yeah, wa what? Yeah, what? she. I, I want somebody. I want somebody to draw U Uchika in that pose that uh, Ragyo did with World's Best Mom. In uh, the, on the mug. Yeah. So, so you just yeah. want her to do the Blumenkrantz? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, she pretty much walked out of her daughter. I feel like there's that. more to that. I just. I, I yeah, I, I'm still waiting to see that, but I guess I'll find out in a couple of weeks. Uh, okay. I know she's, it's full she's confession. She's taking out with Jing right she, now. She, yeah. Okay, also, I thought she yeah. was, like, totally, like, banging some, like, foreign woman, but apparently that was I thought, Connie. Yeah, yeah that, I, that yeah. was really weird. Like, because her relationship with Connie confused me at it's first. It's so confusing to me, and I don't get yeah, it. And I thought yeah. they were lesbians, too, but there's a whole different reason. It's now that. extra Freudian. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of Freudian, let's get into predictions to which show of heads. How is that Freudian? How? Show of heads. How is how that Freudian? Will you shut up, Andrew? No. <laughs> show of heads. How many y'all put Emily Connors for the mother? Uh, I Fuck. I totally did. Fuck. Okay. You yeah. ca you calling me out, I, you son I, of a bitch? I would I, have actually gone with Stephanie Young. Okay, let's explain why. Uh, Jamal, explain why. Cause she looks like Nozomi's final form from Keijo. She looks like an older Noiz Nozomi, aka the protagonist uh, of Keijo, who is played by one Miss Amberly Connors. Yes, except instead of boobs and butts, you have balls and cocks, but that's a different story. <laughs> okay, you're you're getting on my case about that, and you drop that, <laughs> eat my ass. It's boots and cats. Hey, I don't do that, Andrew. That's on your old time, man. Okay. All right. Uh, I had one prediction uh, uh for Kauriko, since we're getting that. Uh, I predicted solely off of the one scene where she screams at the ocean, saying... I just love myself. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be funny if I heard Sarah Whedon have say that? I also have a baseless prediction for Aino. I saw the pink hair, and I thought, Felicia Angel. Oh. Uh, I Aino? No, for Karako. Karako. Okay, yeah, you said Aino. I was confused. <laughs> Sorry. I need the one of my predictions for Karako was Felicia Angel, because, you know... I figured that, that I want to see her do something pink and crazy, which is ironic because she shows up as a, her best friend in a human Pikachu in episode 3. I will say that Karko is grading on a curve an inherently more likable character than Connie. Oh. Yes. yes. I beg to differ, what, what do you mean? But... Okay, actually, I, I will agree with him completely on that. Yeah. Uh, as for the rest of my predictions, uh, uh, oh shit, did I put... Yeah, I, I had Brit April, of course, because, again, obvious casting, pigtails. Okay. But I but I also had... I also had Danny Chambers for some reason. I can, okay, <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. Okay. Uh, as as for Mother of the Year over here, I had Krista McGuire and Anastasia Moodles, because okay. I, I, think, I think those two are good, are good at playing mobs, so... All right. Anybody else had more predictions? Are we good? I, I, you basically got mine, so I'm good. Yeah. All right, then. Mm -hmm. Get right into it. Kaoko is voiced by Michaela Kratz, and Uchika is voiced by Colleen Clickenbeard. Michaela Kratz, you've heard her in other roles as Doll from Black Butler Book of Circus, Maya Kaya Sakashiro from Keijo, 
Clementine from Overlord, Susan and Kagami from Ultimate Otaku Teacher, and speaking of Pink Hair, she's Rosia from Show by Rock. Uh, Ursa Scarlet, I mean... <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Well, 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 to be fair. If, well, to if, be you're fair. Just gonna, if you're just gonna say it... She she is Urza Scarlet. Let's be honest. So. Uh, Urza Scarlet, try, played by Colleen uh, Clinkenbeard. <laughs> okay, okay, let's try that again. Oh wait, mm. Urza Scarlet plays Colleen Clinkenbeard. Shut up, Andrew. <laughs> Colleen Clinkenbeard. You've heard her in other roles as Urza Scarlet from Fairy Tale, Akane's mom from Love Tyrant, Momo Yayurosu from My Hero Academia. <laughs> yes, mm. Scarlet from Space Daddy. And Minako from Yuri on Ice. Who's Minako again? She's the teacher, the ballet Okay, teacher. okay. Yeah, I remember now. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so... Right. Let's get this out of the way. Hardy, what are your thoughts? Well, um, we don't really get too much uh, of a performance from the mom. Um, it's usually background and flashbacks and stuff like that. Um, but Colleen definitely has her enough experience playing moms both in real life and in anime uh, to make it sound convincing and um, and uh, and respectable. And I think she does a really good job here. And the best moment for me was in a certain flashback where we get to see a little bit of her unstable side, I believe. Yeah. Where she's training Ayano and Ayano says, what if I can't do this? And and she looks at her with these wide eyes and goes, you know, says something. I can't remember the exact line. And it just gives you a bit of a hint that maybe Uchika's not all right in the head. Um, I think she was able to convey that moment off really well. So as far as Kaoruko, Michaela Krantz is easily becoming one of my favorite voice actresses to listen to lately, especially know, right? in comedic and energetic roles. Um, oh, yeah. Because th- listening to Karako, quite honestly, was very similar to listening to Karo and Cardcaptor Sakura because I do not like this character either. She is vindictive brat and very similar to Connie but I really do like the energy and and pep that Michaela brings to her she's she's unlikable but she's very fun to watch and to listen to and I think Michaela just pulls it off spectacularly her crush on Kintaro makes it funnier ooh yeah I was gonna bring that up yeah. that she is actually a for teacher <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, Jamal? Uh, yeah, so... I'm with, I'm with Hardy. I, I, I've only heard bits and pieces of Connie. I mean, she does a pretty good job. She, I've heard her a lot about my world, so this is really nothing different, but I'm with you, Hardy. She's not right in the head, and I really want to know more before I pass judgment on her, because I thought she was a bad mother, but something tells me, just wait to see. There's something. I... I don't know what, but it's something. As for Michaela Kratz, yeah, she <laughs> she knows when to go all out, because Jesus Christ, she's, Kyle Cole is crazy. I mean, like, it's like to the point, it's like, she's just the character you love to hate. No matter what. And Kyle Cole's not definitely not right in the head if you see the Flashback to her idol in middle school. Mm. But, you know, that's a thing. Psychological warfare. So, you know, do whatever it takes. And Michaela's got to reflect that very easily. I just didn't recognize that was her in episode two. I'm like, who this? I was also wondering who that was. Who that? Yeah, because when she's just yelling to the beach, I'm like, who is this? And then I see Michaela, I was like, Yep, she's at it again. Yeah, there's another voice I can't recognize, but <laughs> hey, she does a very good job with Kyle and I, except for the character, I have no qualms with it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Black? Uh, yeah, I would actually say, because this is actually a show I have watched in Japanese and English, I would actually say the thing I love about Michaela is the brattiness she brought to Kariko, which um, I think 
actually humanize the character a little bit because again i mean what I, what i just really liked about it was uh, going back to kind of talking about connie for a minute uh it's a little hard to distinguish connie and kaoko because they have similar backstories similar features in fact if you made kaoko blonde she would almost entirely be hard to tell it must have been even, it must have been even harder in the manga because they both have very light colored hair so yeah. both of them would have been the same so, color in print yeah so i can't imagine what it's like being a manga reader for this thing and trying to be like wait i thought her name was connie her name is kaoko i'm, I'm confused but uh the the thing the thing is i I feel like Michaela was able to make her not feel threatening, which which I think it actually benefits the character in a way that Connie needs to feel threatening, because Connie is kind of a sociopath. Kaworko is just an arrogant brat, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's yeah. why I said grading on a curve. I think Kaworko is not as bad of a person <laughs> because anybody who just spreads their cold to a rival. They're not really evil. They're just kind of bratty. <laughs> they're not right in the head, lah. No pun well, intended. They're, they're, no, no, they're not right in the head. But at the same that, time, th here's like... the thing: that doesn't seem like something a evil villain comes up with. That seems like yeah. something a six-year-old child thinks. Yeah, a spoiled brat just comes up with basically. It, it's also yeah, like oh, I'll get yeah, more into it. Fact that... I'll go into it more yeah. in my analysis of this character because I have a couple of things to say and think, but. Yeah, okay. Okay, like, I just want you to think about this. Okay, it's understandable a six-year-old will give somebody a cold, but tying someone up and giving them a cold? Okay, yeah, th this well, is why I want to know if that's the same in the manga or not, because this makes me think, like, this was, like, a throwaway, like, gag panel in the manga, and this, they made it feel like this much more dramatic weirdly rapey looking scene in the anime this this is another silver guardian situation for me where the manga is very different from how they did it in the i i would not anime. be surprised if that scene was done differently or at least was not hung on to as long manga readers of hanabato please tell me how that scene turned out in the manga i need to know now i, I mean uh, okay I, i'll just talk about uchika and then i'll i'll stop but, um, Colleen Klinkenbeard, I love Colleen Klinkenbeard, she's one of my favorite voice actresses, uh, she, I mean, she often plays a mom character, so she's playing a mom character here. That's something she does really well, so, what do I have to complain about? We don't really see Uchika that much, but Colleen Klinkenbeard was a great fit for the character, so, there you go. So. Okay. So, Uchika is, as Colleen, Colleen does a really good job at being a bad mom, who... Uh, I, by the way, during this conversation, I realized, outside of that burp I just made, I realized what this character is in the guise of the show. She is the shonen sports version of Goku. You're yeah. not uh, wrong. You're not wrong, but uh, she's not an idiot. So. I what would the fuck do you- Okay. Oh, you're, I thought- I would actually say she's more like Jing Freaks. Shit, actually, that is... Mm. Because we forget that Goku abandoned his kids not by choice, it's because he was dead. Yeah, it's he because died. he did. You know what, you're right. You know what, that is a better comparison. She is more Jing than she is Goku. You're right, you're right. Mm. Okay, but yeah, Colleen does a good job. I don't have much to say because there's not much to really add. Let's talk about Kariko and Michaela. Uh, first off, let's talk Michaela. Michaela, every time I hear her, it feels like I'm listening to a new actress every time, and it's really interesting. She has this very distinct voice, and I can never tell what kind of performance she's going to give, but the performance I got was effectively bratty Ojo Sama Shonen Rival, and I love it because she is so absurd and outrageous at times, but when she also goes really hard and gets really passionate into the game, I can feel this intensity and this struggle for her. And I think that's actually kind of why I think she's probably one of my favorite performances in the dub, period. Also, as for Kaoriko, 
I actually enjoyed this character a lot more than I was expecting. I'm not going to say they're a good character, but she feels like... This show gives me a lot of those big, dumb shonen moments in the last couple episodes that I really like. And seeing her perseverance... The, the fact that she had to work super hard to get to the level she does, the fact that her cold thing, as immature as it was, was her methodology of making a fair fight, as well as just the fact that, like, she actually... Here's the thing. She is Connie Christensen's character arc better in that I see how her... I see how her team starts to respect her and comes to appreciate her and how they get along better. You see that happen. You don't really see that with Connie. You actually see how her team kind of goes from hating her guts and thinking, oh, she's just a spoiled outcast. Wait till you see her get owned to, oh, wow, that was a really close game. You did a good job because you worked really hard for this, didn't you? And that's kind of... Perf hmm? Perfectly balanced Perf is all things should be. Yeah, uh, except not in that voice. But I think yeah. I think I get a very big shonen rival vibe from her. That's why I like her a lot more than I was expecting. Is that she is a total brat, but she is like a brat who has worked her whole life for this kind of point to get to where she's at. And you and those are the characters that when they change and grow and develop, they become really interesting rivals and good friends. So I'm really curious to see where her character goes. Also, I think her crush on the on the teacher coach man is very funny. So yeah, she was a lot more fun as a shonen rival character to me than I think some of you other guys. But Michaela Krantz is probably one of my favorite performances in the stub. Also, I like how her crush inadvertently kind of makes her a rival of Nagisa too. Her crush Nagisa? No, her crush on Kentaro kind of makes her a rival of, of Nagisa as well. Uh, Nagisa's into him? Is I she? don't see I it? don't see that at all. Apparently in the manga, I could be wrong, but I heard that in the manga they end up together. But, okay. Because, like, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, there's no real signs of, like, her being attracted to him at all. Though I prefer her, her, I prefer her with her actual girlfriend, who Jamal. Please introduce us to. Yes. Yeah, so moving on to next doc is we up next we have uh, Riko Izumi and we have Nozomi Ishizawa. Now Riko is a uh, nice childhood friend and member of the Kito Kamachi Badminton Club. She's she's seen to be the mother of the group essentially and. In her own way, kind of has an old complex, which is like the focus she, of episode she's six. She's less of a mother and more of a big sister. Uh, well, technically that is true, yes, but it's more to it than that. Okay. And the zombie is uh, the old friend of Nagisa and Rico's, as well as the rival. They used to play together in middle school before uh, she got she was able to get a scholarship to a uh, Sushi Sogo High. Uh, she, yeah, pretty much. She, the two beat on the court, and uh, it's a pretty good match. It's a pretty good match. Uh, those OB shed some uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and I'm gonna be honest. That is probably the, the this is probably the most unique character design I've ever seen. The chopsticks and the lips are such a strange combination of things. Yeah, and if you see the end card, she looks kind of hot, to be honest. But. Okay, yes, yeah, she do she does look very hot. Was that her? I thought that was Uchika. No, I think no. that's her. Okay. In the chat, no, that's her. Okay, yeah, she does look very hot in that. But no, uh, you pair that character design up with her coach, who... Okay, how, how, oh, how, how do I put this lightly? Um, her coach... New slip, six ships. Her coach... Looks like the exact kind of character who blackmails you into sex in any sort of dojin. Oh, good God. Tell the me skinny I'm wrong. version. The Tell skinny me. version. Uh, the skinny version, but... Yeah, the he, other he, one is short and fat and greasy. He, he's pale, his hair's messy, and he's got really ugly lips. He looks like that exact kind of character where he's like, I took a picture of you in a compromising position. Get naked. That's what he looks like. Andrew, now I can't unsee it. Why do you have to bring these things? <sighs> because right. you can. Because right. I can. 
Because I no, can doesn't... No, because you want to. You know what? You're right. It's because I can, and I know I shouldn't, but it's because I want to. <laughs> you know what you should... You know what you should be breaking, though? What should it's I be them predictions. Ah, okay. that is a good idea. In regards to predictions, uh, I did not have any for Nozomi, because at the time of making these, she was not a character that had yet shown up, or at least not in the sub where I was watching at the t uh, point. But I had one prediction for Riko Izumi, and that was Afia Yu. I thought Afia would have been a very natural fit for Riko. Okay. As far as I am concerned, I too did not make a prediction for Nozomi, but going back and looking at the character, if I had, it would have been Elizabeth Maxwell. Um, Ooh, and yeah, for we'll Rico nice. Izumi, I had Bryn April because she reminds me of a character from the other sports anime airing this season. Mm. I I feel you. I feel you. As for me, mm -hmm. I did make a prediction for Nozomi because at the time we were six episodes in the dub. I figured might as well. I had Anastasia Munoz. I had Brittany Karbowski, and I had Alex Moore, because I figured all three of them could really make this character something. Especially Anastasia, because, my God. You just threw the darts all over the board, sort of. Yeah, wait till you hear this. So, uh, remember I said how I based... Look, if you I just throw every it? dart everywhere, it's eventually bound to hit a hole somewhere. <laughs> yeah, remember I said Paul Megan? Yes. So, uh... Rico kind of reminds me of a character from 18F, and one of my predictions was Jill Harris. Okay. But, but I also threw the Alexis tip to Caitlyn Barr because I figured, you know, they could bring something a little soft-spoken, but not quite out there, like, you know, kind of reserved. To which, in essence, I was actually right, because Rico is voiced by Jill Harris. Yes, and Nozomi is voiced by Lindsay Hill. So, let me pull up my script here. Say it! Sorry. I want you to scream it! Yes, Jill Harris, you've heard her in other roles as Miki and All Out. She's Asuka Kurashida in Alcada for Rhythm Across the Blue, Madeleine in My Hero Academia, Hifumi Takimoto in New Game. Best girl. And because I brought up 18 if she's Natsuki Kamikawa. Lindsay Hale, on the other hand, she's Yu Yu and Arya the Scarlet Ammo AA, Miwa Yamamura and Barakamon, Hitomi Ichijo and Castle Town Daddy Lion, and my personal favorite, Midori Nakazawa and Norman. So, Hardy, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, let's start with Nozomi because she doesn't have as big of a role in comparison to Riko. Um, Lindsay Hale, I've always had sort of a strange opinion about her voice because I like the energy and the life that she brings to the performances that I've heard her in, but I wasn't always a fan of the delivery. Um, but I think it's a definite improvement here because it sounds a whole lot better and we get to see more emotional aspects because in shows like Barakamon and no Rin, she's basically just really peppy and, and loud and shouting this you actually get to see more depth to this character uh sort of her ins and outs and personal emotions and what makes her tick and i think we get it, it's really good in Lindsay's case to where we get to explore uh her acting abilities in those manners as far as Rico is concerned, it's Jill Harris doing her best friend voice that you've heard from countless other anime. Um, and there's, that's certainly not a bad thing. It's, it's basically what Jill does best, is this sort of best friend, soft-spoken, uh, really sweet, good-natured character. Um, and yeah, I think she just she brings it home. Yeah, so, yeah, going off of that, it, it, yeah, it does seem like something Joe usually does. I just, I never really, for one, I've never really seen her as a glasses character, but for two, I never really seen her to be a, a sporting type. I know she's a caring type easily. And that whole episode six, uh, even she pointed out that, like, 
it was more real for her than she never expected to be. Because, you know, Rico, she has a kind of anxiety because she knows she's not up, up to somewhere like Nagisa's level or has the natural talent of, I don't know, you know, she's just doing her own thing. But when she has to battle her old friend, that, well, that seems like a shorter thing to do. But when she has to battle her old friend, she wonders if she can really pretty much cut her teeth, like, try to do the best she can, see if she can beat her old friend. Well, I'm not going to mention that spoiler, but, yeah, she did a pretty good job. Lindsay Hill, on the other hand, you're right, she does, she, to me, she displays a lot of spark, a lot of energy in these characters, so it was surprising to see her so reserved with Nozomi, but, it, it, it felt a little off-kilter, but I think she handled the character very well. I don't. I hope we get to see more of her. If not for what it is, it was pretty good. Uh, lack. Uh, yeah. Um, we have two characters. Uh, we have two characters here who are kind of in the background, but at the same time, they do leave kind of an impression. Uh, with with Rico, she actually has her own. Well, her own little arc, actually. Ironically. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, Rico actually has a really kind of interesting role to play in the fact that she is the character who has no special talents, and yet she's here fighting for herself, and when she feels defeated, Jill Harris does a great job of really making you feel that, that sense of defeat. Yeah. It's it's really impressive, and it's another one of those those things that I'm complimenting this dub on. It feels grounded. It feels real, and that's really one of the the best aspects of uh, Rico's like Jill Harris's performance as Rico. Um, now for no for Nozomi, it's a little bit harder because she's not really in the show that much, and when she is in the show, she doesn't actually talk that much. Um, she's very quiet, but it, it's, if I'm being honest, Lindsay Hale's perform voice as Nozomi isn't really that distinctive. It doesn't really stand out, but at the same time, Nozomi's not really kind of a character that stands out. I mean, her design is very distinctive for the rest of the characters, but personality-wise, she's, there's not that much to go on necessarily. Um, but at the same time, I think Lindsay Hale did a good job from what I heard. And I think the scene when you see that she's kind of an abusive relationship with her coach, that's really effective. Like, there's a really powerful moment there that it, it, the fact that she gets even more quiet is actually really interesting. Uh, I know what I wanted to say about Rico. They could have easily given her a really mousy voice. Like, they could... They could have had her talk like this through the whole dub. And they didn't go that route. And I'm really, really appreciative that they didn't go that route. Because usually the quiet glasses... The the, uh, the manga neko, I believe they're called. Is that what they're called? They tend to have... Megane. Meganeko? Yeah. Okay, Meganeko. They tend to be really quiet and mousy in the way they talk. So I'm really glad they didn't do that for Rico. So, that's kind of my thoughts. Okay, so, Lindsay Hill's character was interesting to me. I really very much do not know her work outside of Barakamon, but she has a very interesting tone that was, like I said, was pretty quiet for most of this, but I do like when she basically rebels against uh, the coach, who is voiced by Barry Yandel, by the way. We're also not covering him, but he's Barry Yandel. I'm sorry I exalted your character's appearance, but it's true. Anyway, yeah, that was I left field. Like, did anybody find me? Yeah, he them? he his design doesn't fit the show. It's it awesome. does not. It's weird. Anyways, um, but yeah, Lindsay Hale, uh, she does a pretty good job with this character. She's pretty quiet and like sportsman like, but I like when she kind of lets herself run free and has like a genuine match with Nagisa outside of just like listening to teacher all the time and it's, it's it's a nice moment uh i love jill harris as rico i think she does a, she has a very calming voice in regards to the roughness in regards to nagisa 
and even then you see the fear and the anxiety and the frustration and like her psyching herself up or forcing herself to psych up when she's getting really into the match and like the genuinely crushing defeat and i think jill plays this part pretty spectacularly and she's a natural fit for this character and i love her relationship with Nagisa to the point that it's like I got actually mad at the show where it's like god damn it Nagisa hug your girlfriend she's crying damn it <laughs> I actually like screamed that at my tv <laughs> I got really into those last couple of episodes I watched it like I was like yes this is the shonen sports shit I want damn it this is great so like yeah. the match with her and Nozomi like when basically halfway across the court this, uh, Nagisa is just like, let me hear you scream it! It's like, I want to win! It's like, yes! God damn it, it's great. It was such, it was so close. But I think Jill's a fantastic fit as yeah. as this character. All right, I'm done. Also, those chopsticks are fucking weird. I know there's something else, but the fact that they are literally just chopsticks to me bugs me. Anyways, I'm done. Yeah, let's help you sleep at night. Hey, right, so we're all good to move on then? Yep. yep. Let's do it. Alright, then. So, our next pair, we have uh, Kita Kamachi's badminton coach, uh, Ketao Tachibana, and Akto, Akto, Ileda Fujisawa. Their manager. The, yes, the club's manager, uh, Ketao Tachibana. He's a former Olympic hopeful who blew out his knee, thus ending his chance at the Olympics. When you're introduced to him, he's kind of a little headsy, gropesy with Iono in the beginning. Yeah, that was weird, and I think that was very much like where the comedy manga was more apparent at the start that was kept in translation, and it's very jarring with this anime's dramatic approach. Yeah, it's it feels like maybe at that point they really didn't know what kind of show they were going for. Okay. And I, I guess maybe the director wanted to take the show in a different route. Mm. So. Well, he did, so... Yes, and uh, speaking of different routes, we also have Elena, who's Ayano's childhood friend. Uh, decides, it's a funny story. They did, both decided to join the tennis club to meet guys, and then she convinces her to join the badminton club because it's what she does best. Also, she, also she wasn't going to... She wasn't going to go in the sea of piranhas that was after the tennis guy, who I think was Damon Mills. I, th I think that was Damon uh, Mills. If it's, if it's Sayanji, it was Damon Mills. Yes, it was Sayanji, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. As for predictions, uh, predictions, I had uh, one for Elena and two for the guy whose name I forgot. I just wrote down as Blonde Coach Douche. Uh, wow. For Elena, I thought Michelle Rojas would have been a really good fit for Elena as, like, regards to, like, a big sister character that was a little spunky. And in regards to blonde coach douche, I had either Eric Vale or Clifford Chapin. Um, I had a pair of predictions for these characters. For Kintaro Tachibana, based completely off of his looks because he reminds me of the care one of the characters from a certain magical index i oh, i God. chose newton Pittman because with his uh. sunglasses on he looks exactly like the character from that show and also for elena fujisawa also based on her appearance and her sort of behavior i chose genie Tirado because she plays a lot of characters similar to that I also had Genie Tirado. Uh, for later, uh, pretty much for some of the same reasons as Genie, I also had Brynn and Mallory, because I thought, you know, but the best friend, you know, that's a normal, natural voice, someone that's friendly. As for Tachi Bond himself, I figured, who could be tough without actually sounding tough? So I had David Wald, Austin Tindall, and Rico Fajardo. Mm. Seriously? Am I the only one here who thought Eric Vale? I also said Eric Vale. Oh, sorry. Okay. Mm. That was my bad. Hey, anything else, Lack? Are you good? I'm good. 
Okay, so I get into it. Uh, let's start with Yelena. Yelena is voiced by Sir Weedenhev. And Tachibana is voiced by Kyle Ignacy. Kyle Ignacy is uh, pretty much brand new to Federation. You've heard him as Kyle Hadasaki in Cheer Boys, Inokida in Hakada Tokotsu Robins, he's Honey in Abaka, Shiro Shiromine in Sugumomo, and Chiaki Uchima in Suri Dari Children. So, we didn't have, you've heard her as uh, Celeste in Honey Pop. Aika Sube, aka Tail Blue, are going to be the Twin Tails. Suikaku and Kankole. Non Toyoguchi and Keijo. And one of interest, uh, Mihau Mishiki, convenience store boyfriends, because, you know, I'm going to go first on this one. The thing about So We Have, and the thing is, I did not look at the list when I started watching the dub. So I was like, this sounds pretty natural. Who is this? And then when I see her take a tennis racket to the coach, I was like, wait, that's her we did have? Because the thing about it is, and the reason I bring up convenience store boyfriend is because in both shows, she's able to suppress her nasality. Like when you hear her, she sounds kind of nasal at times to the point we may have called her a chihuahua on occasion or two. <laughs> Which is kind of sad, but hey, what can you do? So the fact that she can suppress the nasality and it is able to sound more natural, I, I think that actually is her natural voice, I'm not sure. Mm. It really su surprised me. I think there's a Yamato commentary that actually does have like what she naturally sounds like, I just gotta hear it. I, I, I've seen a few of her videos on Twitter, I've heard what she sounds like. It's okay, just, okay. Know, it, it, it could fluctuate at times, you never know. Mm -hmm. As for Kyle Ignacy over here... Welcome back to, I can't believe it's not Dave Trosco, part two. Uh, huh. Because, as I said in the Robbins episode, I literally thought that was Dave Trosco, to the point I'm like, oh, for the love of God, why did they cast Dave Trosco as the pervy guy? And I was like, no, it's not him. And they do sound exactly similar, because I found out they're both Hungarian, but that's beside the point. Kyle really manages to stand out as the coach, pretty well he can he has a a commanding presence in his voice without being overbearing because there are times you could be commanding and be a bit overbearing but he manages to rein it in here and i really like what i saw hardy yeah i have to basically agree with everything you said about kentaro he i did also think it was dave trosco for the longest time um in fact i thought it was definitely him until i saw the actual credit list i'm like huh that's 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 weird, but anyways, yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. And um, as far as Sarah as Elena, I always do appreciate when she gets to use what I call her big girl voice, because so many times she's reduced to playing this sort of chibi ish um, little girl sort of uh, um, exaggerated high pitched voice, and so it's a nice welcome when you get to hear her playing something a bit more natural um she hasn't played anyone as old as say her celeste voice just yet but then again her celeste voice is is unique in its own right um but yeah i i think it's it's a pleasure to hear her play someone a bit more uh, closer to her national register natural register Mm -hmm. yeah. So I liked it. Alright, that? Uh, okay, so initial thoughts. When I first heard uh, Kyle Ignesi as um, Kentaro, I was a little thrown off about how he kind of sounded a little older than I thought he would. But as I got used to it and I felt like he entered the role a little bit more, I can't imagine anybody... I can't imagine Kentaro with any other voice at this point, honestly. Um, for Elena, for Sarah Wiedenheft, uh, she did a magnificent job, honestly. Uh, I, I was really impressed at how just, like, I'm trying to think of the right words here, but just how real she felt in the role. Like, she was delivering the line so well, and her voice just fit the character so great. She had, she had sass, she had charisma... She had the energy, right? It was just... It was all around really good. <coughs> um, 
And Lena's kind of a unique character in the fact that she really is a sideline character. Like, she is an experiencer rather than a doer. <coughs> so it can be hard to get a character like that right. And I, it's just, it was really great to hear a voice like that coming out of her. And for Kentaro, Kyle Ignezi had such an authority that the character really needed. It was nice to hear, especially in the in the more dramatic scenes of the show. And I think uh, how he plays the character came out great. I like the kind of uniqueness of his voice. I think he gave a lot of personality to Kentaro. Uh, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts. So, yeah. Okay, so... First off, Kyle. I think Kyle... This is very different than I think what I'm used to hearing of him, or what little I've heard of him. It's a much gruffer, like, older-sounding voice than I think I was expecting from him. And I wasn't sure what I was going to get when I saw his name attached. But I feel he actually grows into the role of the coach pretty naturally, and when it comes to his pep talks... And like his advice to his to his trainees, he really does play the part of the coach who's like growing and learning alongside his students. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Elena is a really fun character and she's really interesting. And she is also Ayano's girlfriend. Fuck you, fight me. Um, but yes, I think... Sarah does a really interesting job where she's like a much more not like not it's like it is high pitched but not in a way that like I'm usually used to hearing with Sarah where it's like either like younger or squeakier characters this is like much more casual and subdued and I think it's actually a really good voice that really lends itself well to the character of Elena and I think she's really interesting, and I love just the tone of voice she has, and how she's very no-nonsense when it comes to Ayano's deal, and she's always the one in her corner, even as she devol she effectively devolves back into a shonen villain, because more on that later, she basically kind of transforms back into a shonen villain, um, but... I, yeah, no, I loved Sarah Wiedenhap as Elena, and I think she's a great job, and she is a great character that is very supportive for her possibly evil girlfriend. <laughs> okay, then, so, good to move on, then? Yep. To our main two. Uh, yes, pretty much the episode of this uh, sports documentary, if you will. We have Dagisa Ark. Uh, fuck, I'm trying again. We have Dagisa Aragaki, the captain of Kitakamachi's badminton club, and we have Ayano Hadasaki, pretty much most of the center of these plot threads. Dagisa, she pretty much fell into a slump after she lost to Ayano in middle school. Uh, she works day and night to try to develop her stress. Really, it's just she has a high complex. She is my, she is my big shonen beefcake, and I love her, and she is a good girl. Yes. And Ayano is uh, pretty much... the She used to pretty much force to join the badminton club, To at which point she did start to get some character development, but then after a few badminton matches, get some fierce enemies, she becomes a woman possessed. And pretty much has a hate, slight, well not slight, she pretty much has a hatred of her mother at this point. Or at least some for, mommy for, issues. Yeah, definitely some mommy issues. For what reason, who knows? Mm. We, so, so, let's get right into predictions. Uh, yes. I actually had two for Nagisa. And because they both play these sort of tall, very um, stoic big sister type characters. Uh, I had, oh, what is her name? Uh, Michelle Rojas, and I had Terry Doty. Ooh, good picks, good picks. Yeah, and for Ayano, I once again also went to Sarah Wiedenhef, but I also had Jade Saxton. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I had one for Nagisa and two for Ayano. Uh, for Ayano, I was thinking either Jeannie Tirado 
or Tia Ballard would have been a really good fit for Ayano. And in regards to Nagisa, I think this was the only one that was actually dictated by Keijo, with the exception being Uchika. Marissa Lenti. I thought Marissa Lenti would have been a really good natural fit for the part of Nagisa. Hmm. I guess in terms of those predictions, I'm not alone because I also had Marissa for Nagisa. I also had Brit April for something different, but uh, going back to the uh, earlier comment about Nagisa, I have Lindsay Seidel question mark? Question mark? Yeah. Like a maybe? I, like, I wasn't really like, too sure because I know she does... She's done a deep voice. Of course it's Nagisa. So when you made that little thighs joke, I was like... Okay, so... Um, I'm just going to say this right now. Would you like to tell the viewers Wait. at home what the name of this Discord chat is right now? <laughs> yes, the name of the chat that Andrew so <laughs> properly named is the Nagisa Thighs Appreciation Chat. I mean, can you blame me? <laughs> Can you blame me? Look at them. Like, look, everybody's going to be focusing what's up top. And what's up top, very nice too. But yes. those fucking thighs, though. Like, the power that goes into each step that they animate. It's like, god damn it, girl. Yes, anyway. Rico's probably looking topic. at those and just drooling every time she <laughs> sees them glistening with sweat. Which is ironic, considering what voice actor said that, but more on that later. What is... As okay, do you know what the word ironic means? You've said it, like, at least a dozen times tonight in so many different... Can classes. I finish my predictions, please? It's like rain on your wedding day. I'm sorry. No, that's just a really bad coincidence, Lack. Okay. Yeah. yeah. As for Ayano, I also had Chidi Tirado, but I also had Felicia Ajo, which is kind of ironic we brought up Keijo, because... Da, da, da. The voice of Ayano is Emily Connors, and the voice of Nagisa is Don and Bennett. Mm. Don Bennett, you've heard of other roles such as Kikuchi from Mikiba's Trip, Minua from Adrigatari, Miku Kobayakawa from Keijo, and Isabella Yang from Yo Ice. She's also Sasuke from Konohana Kitan, because I want to bring that oh, up. Oh, definitely. And Frosh. Yes. And Frosh. And Frosh. Frosh is a good frog. Mm -hmm. Or cat. Frosh identify is not by gender, she, but by being Frosh a frog is a good who is a cat. Frosh is a good frat. Let's leave it there. She's yeah. a good... Uh, Frosh is a good frat. Yes. Yes. And I believe... Yes. Uh, yes. And I believe Connors, you've heard her is Belly and Honey Pop and Honey Cap Studio. Chihiro Sakai and Cheer Boys, Akane Hiyama and Love Tyrant. Miss Joke and My Hero Academia. And Real Wallet and Real Rainbow Gate. What a very interesting, like, leading ladies picks. Really interesting choices. Okay, I'll I'll save my time. Mm -hmm. Yes, you save your time while Hardy spends his. You go first, Hardy. Okay. Um, I think it's a very interesting choice for Amber using Amber Lee Connors as Iano, because this is a very different type of role than what she usually plays. Um, usually she's played as more of a sort of a va va voom, you know, vixeny type. Um, yep. You know, and and this refer back to the Silver Guard. Yes, mm -hmm. and and Iano simply is not that. She is very petite, very small. Um, doesn't stand out in the crowd very much. Uh, doesn't really say all that much, to be honest. But. Um, it's interesting hearing Amber's performance because, like I've said in the past, I sort of kind of have a love-hate relationship with her delivery because uh, she can often sound, oftentimes sound bored. Um, here, I think because the character is very timid, it works a whole lot better. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, 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 it's an interesting take on a, on a type of role that she does not play often and I'd honestly be interested in seeing her play more of this type of role in the future. And um, I do want to see more of Iono's sort of psychotic episodes as she goes further and further. Let's put it this way. The show starts out, Iono is best girl, Nagisa is worst girl, 
And as the show goes along, their roles completely reverse. And we, mm-hmm. as far as early as episode two, Nagisa completely changes character and just becomes the most lovable, lovable goof. And Ayano slowly degrades into psychiatrist. Just, I, fu- uh, I find it interesting. You specifically say like b- you mentioned the phrase boredom. Is that she? She is somebody who keeps winning these matches and she does not give any shit she is like Ugh, whatever yeah. and it's like right. i i think yeah. that works really well especially for i you know yeah yeah uh now on to nagisa let me put it to you this way um i did not read the press release before going and watching this dub i went straight into it and for the longest time, I was listening to Nagisa's voice, and I was saying, who is this? Why is this so familiar? I've heard this before, and I cannot tell who it is. And, and it just nagged on me for the entirety of the first two episodes. Who is that? <laughs> and then I read the press release, and I'm like, okay, now I hear it. And the reason it set me back a bit is because Don Bennett is not known for playing these types of roles. Her, she usually goes back and forth between very deep, husky voices and really high-pitched, um, girly voices, uh, like in Anime Gatari's. And, and I think the only time we've actually listened to her use her regular voice is in Dances with Devils, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you are. I am probably mistaken. But, I'd also uh, say, in regards to like her deeper, huskier voice, good examples of this would be uh, Satsuki from Konohana Kitan and uh, Satan from yeah. uh, Seven Mortal Sins. Right, right. But yeah, I was like, once I read who it was, I'm like, okay, now I can hear it. And that really speaks a lot to Dawn's abilities as an actress, that she can, even if a, an actress that you've heard a thousand times before, if she could throw you for a loop like that, that's really saying something. And so, yeah, I think she's just absolutely phenomenal in this dub. Uh, just within the first two episodes, and she just takes it from there. So, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, going off of that. Uh, well, Nagisa was the only character I was spoiled for before I even saw the press release, so I knew right off the bat was Don Bennett. And when I heard it, it was... It was actually the kind of voice I expected to hear come out of this character, to be honest, because... And I know for a fact she could pull off this character very well, it's just... At the time of recording, uh, three out of four of us here have met Don Bennett, and I know that's an actual voice, believe it or not, so... Mm. The fact that she lends her voice, it makes the character sound more naturalistic... That should that it should be, you know. Oh yeah, Dodd is super nice. Pleasure meeting you, Dodd. Congratulations on getting the role of Kale, by the way. Holy shit! Yeah, and it's funny because I told some of the other people we met a fest about this episode, except her. I don't know how the hell I managed that, but anyway, mm. Dodd Dodd was what I expected. She she really made Doggy so all that I liked it. Mm. I you know I do right off the bat that was Emily Collins because the the only time I ever heard her really use that voice was Hakata Tokotsu Robbins, and I didn't expect her to sound like a little girl that either, but she managed to play off both dynamics, both the, you know, stern, childish type you see in the beginning, and the possessive type that we've come to know and uh, hate in the later episodes. And I know she's very good at being possessive if you ever see Love Time. But anyway... <coughs> uh, excuse me. But anyway, you, you, yeah. You thought I mean, of Love Tyrant and you started coughing up blood, it sounded like. I thought that was very fitting. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Amber's what I expect. I mean, she's she's more or less the central character, you know. She, she Ayano is a very broken character, to be honest, because a lot of the stuff that's happening to her is kind of what drives her to be mad. Especially in the flashbacks, but we're not talking about that anymore. Amber did a very good job in this world. I can't wait to see what happens in the later episodes. So, Lack? 
Yeah, um, so, for... It, it's interesting, because for Nagisa, they took a route that I was kind of expecting. But for yeah. Ayano, they went a route that I wasn't expecting. Because with Ayano, there's a certain expectation of a character like that, where she's going to have a very light, cutesy voice. For Nagisa, it's like, yeah, she's going to have kind of a tough girl kind of voice. You know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, Ryuku, uh, Ryoko, uh, uh... Matoi? Matoi, yeah, exactly. That kind of, that kind of voice. Uh, and for Ayano, you expect a kind of, uh, Mako kind of voice. But it's interesting that for Ayano, in casting Amber Lee Connors, they went for a more mature sound. Now, knowing what we know about Ayano now... That does make sense why they would want to do it that way. Why they would want to give her to a voice actress who can play someone who's emotionally kind of twisted. And for Nagisa, it makes sense that they want to cast someone who is, you know, tough but also has a softer side to her. There, there's a great post on Tumblr where it's the whole looks like a cinnamon roll but could kill you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Where it has Nagisa as looks like she could kill you, but it's actually a cinnamon roll. Ayano looks like a cinnamon roll, but could actually kill you. Pretty it's not wrong. on yeah. point. Yeah. That's pretty on point. Yeah. That checks out. And, and I think that's a, te that's a testament to both of these actresses in the way that Don M. Bennett, who was essentially cast in a role that's... a tip, And I think this is actually one of the strengths of Hane Bado as a show, is the fact that you've got Nagisa, who is the typical tough girl kind of character who actually has a very soft side to her and you've got Ayano who's the typical soft type girl character who's kind of messed up in the head like who's who's a few like who, who's a few like uh boy taco, cheating on her taco short a few tacos short of a combination plate well, I was going to say a few, like, boyfriend cheating on her moments to ah. school days. Oh. So what you're saying is full-on, like, two seconds away from going Yandere. Got it. Yeah. Well, from from going, cutting off a girl, uh, cutting off a girl's head, putting it in a box, and then killing a pregnant girl. So what you're saying uh. is going full boat. Yeah, full nice boat. Nice. I learned what that was very recently. That was an experience. Yes, yeah. yeah, same. Anyway, School Days is weird. Don't watch it. Um, I don't intend to. Nice birdie. Okay, that was good. My, my ultimate point here is that these two actresses were cast very well in their roles in a sense of these are not your typical kind of anime roles and the fact that you have... These two almost stereotypical characters who have these aspects to themselves that are not typical for these type of characters. And both of these actresses get to shine through in the fact that they are playing characters like this. So, that's kind of my ultimate thought. Okay. I find it very fascinating that Amber Lee Codders and Dawn Bennett are both these characters. Because I've discovered that the both of them are really competent at fluctuating between very high-pitched, like, girly girl characters to much deeper, sultrier, like, either, like, femme fatale seductress or full-on, like, badass, I will kill you, fuck you up type voices. And you hear one of each side from the both of them. Actually, you kind of hear both in regards to Amberly Connors. Uh, starting with Amberly Connors, uh... She sounds a little flighty and, like, very, like, insecure at times, very quiet and timid, but gradually growing warmer to the club until she kind of breaks down and goes full-on, like, she becomes a full-on shonen villain, like, it's really interesting to see that essentially who is the main character becomes the fucking rival character who's like, that was a good game, you weren't shit. I'm not even going to give you attention. You should have been good. And if you're not good, why are you even here? I'm like, that's not something a protagonist says at all. That's something like the final bad guy in Kuriko's basketball's like. Uh, oh, I'm going to butcher. I forget his name and Megan's going to kill me since I think. Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll look it up later. Is um, it Sexy Grimace? No, not Sexy Grimace. I hate that <laughs> fucking nickname. Eat a dick. No, it's the one with heterochromia. Who, 
Okay. Anyways, as but yeah, I think I think Iano's Am as Amberly as Iano is really really good choice, and I think Iano is really fun at times. I just think the show's heavy emphasis on her mom drama is very confusing and not interesting to me, but I think she has some really good matches nonetheless, and I do kind of like seeing her go into her, like, unhinged, like, Yandere mode, and it's kind of a lot of fun to see it in matches. Uh, Don Bennett as Nagisa is fucking amazing, by the way. It's a really interesting departure, but I think it's a very natural fit for Dawn's unique ranges, and I think she's fantastic. She does bring so much life to what I can describe as a cuddly shonen beefcake girl who is amazing and I love her and Nagisa is the best and I wish her the best in her sports and I hope she has very good knees and she manages to achieve her dreams I hope she wins I hope she oh god the fucking match against her and Lindsay was so great like I love seeing Nagisa fight I love seeing Nagisa because she gives me the big dumb shonen vibes that I really get from hard from this show and she is the most shown into me and i love the energy she gives and she is a really fun character and she i like her dilemma is like the struggle of everybody thinking she is naturally gifted but yeah, she has had the, to work like so fucking hard and like twice as hard yeah. to compensate the, for her weight and her height and like putting it's just it's a really interesting it, it, thing I, it's it, it's a genuinely earnest take on the idea of the plight of being considered too perfect i think it's really so, good yeah yeah, and, yeah also side note hardy if they ever like did a modern dirty pair doesn't nagisa look like how k should look in a modern version kind of yeah I could totally see that being the look they give K for a modern dirty pair. But yeah, no, Dawn is stern, like hardcore badass at times, but also very sincere and gets kind of flustered, but is also really friendly and leaderly. I think Dawn's amazing. I think both Amber Lee and Dawn Bennett show a lot of like their ranges. And, like they have impressive ranges, no matter how you shake it, but they really get to show off in the show. And I think they're both very impressive. I was watching the latest episode um, not too long ago, and basically Nagisa's entire strategy is row, row, fight the power. God, <laughs> yeah. Just put it's her, like, put like, her like, in a fucking. Screw your comment. strategy. I will overpower you with pure muscle. Put her in a fucking common. Uh, put her in a common cape. Give her put the her shades. Okay. Have either... her do the guy next pose. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. I, I mean, I mean, her boobs jiggle enough. So. Oh, yeah. you're fucking right. God she's got yo. She's got common spirit in Yoko's boobs. There you go. The there you go. The child that never and, was. And and Simone's anxiety. <laughs> oh God, you're right. I I love Nagisa. She's my precious little shonen cinnamon meat roll, <laughs> and she's great, and I love her. Tengen Tapa. Tengen Tapa Hanebaro. <laughs> Yo. Yo. Oh, please. Oh, please, honey. I'll show you really how to play Batman. Okay. Okay. I, I've said my piece. Let's move on. Let's wrap it yeah, up. Let's, let's wrap yeah, it up. speaking of wrapping up, let's get the final thoughts. So, Hadi, what are your final thoughts? Um, I... I like this show in general. But... C but it's so vindictive. At times, it just seems mean. Like there's so much mean spirited in this. Yeah. When I mean, when you compare it, when you watch it right next to something like Haru Kanarisi. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I was gonna say. And it's yeah. funny that both shows came out this season and aired right next to each other because one isn't as well animated, has significantly more fan service. But it's so cute and sweet and full of heart. And at the end, even the losers and and the winners are friends. And, you know, it's just, it's got this vibe to it that just makes you feel good. Hanebato plus is not that. Hanebato yeah, feels it, much more realistic yeah. to me, if we're being honest. It, it does. It helps that Haro kind of receive is actually genuinely funny. Right. Too. Yeah. So. Yeah, Hanebato is not that. Hanebato, you've got 
vicious rivalries, you know, vindictiveness, just, you know, hey, don't step out of my court, I will crush you. And both from, from both its protagonists and its antagonists, nobody likes each other in this show. And it's they both a plus and like a minus. Other. Yeah, it's. I mean, Rico and Nagisa genuinely yeah. care about each other. So. And the you girl, likes everybody, the girl, so. The girlfriends support each other. Yeah. And so, I mean, the dub is solid. Um, and I do like the show. It's just, it, it, the vindictiveness kind of gets to me a little bit. So, I don't know. Okay. I do want to do another episode on Harukana Receive. I hope we get to do that. Um,. We but, shall see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, animation wise. It's, yeah, it, it's no two anime have ever come out at a more perfect time with each other. Right. I feel like. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's my, that's my final thought on it. Yeah. I can, I can see where you come from. I mean, when I watch Hot Bottle, it feels more like kind of a sports documentary, like, you know, pretty much the rise and fall of insert the main character here, depending on which arc you're watching. And, but with sports and the competitiveness, I can store it for late because I felt the same way doing martial arts. So I know how tough it can be at times. I don't think the show is as vindictive, but really lack. <laughs> I just well, replied to that. Anyway, yeah. Oh, you did? Oh, is that, is, is that just her with the crazy eyes just drinking a bottle? Yeah, that is a big Yeah, word. but I don't... Also, before I forget, uh, Akashi Seijiro is the name of the character from Kuriko I was thinking of. Don't kill me, Megan, with scissors. Yeah. Yeah, Continue. so I don't see it as vindictive. I can understand why the characters are the way they are, but at the end of the day, sports is kind of a competitive thing. I just hope they come out of it. Not too much, though. Like, As for the dub itself, the dub makes is it makes it very natural easier to listen to because you know some of these characters are using their natural for a lot of these actors are using their natural voices so they focus more on the dialogue is that's something chris sabbath pointed out to me uh, thanks for getting me to watch the black clover extra stuff so when mm -hmm. you hear these when you hear them be more natural you know they can focus more on the acting and i can't really find any fault with any of the actors not even Nozomi, because Nozomi is a reserved character. We may never see her again. Who knows? But I think everybody did their job okay. if you buy played their part as well as they should. Mm -hmm. So, Lack? Yeah, um, I really have no complaints. I mean, Connie could sound a little goofy here and there with her accent, but honestly, besides that... Uh, I, it really didn't bother me all that much. Um, yeah, everything about this dub I really like, in spite of the in spite of the somewhat noticeable flaws of the series, especially when you compare it to its sister show, Harukana Receive, which is honestly perfect. Don't at me. Uh, and I mean, it has a pet turtle. It has a pet turtle. Yeah, it's about cousin. Oh Lula. god. Um, but uh. It's it's really good. It's a really strong dub. And it's so surprising that a show like this, Funimation would decide to dub, to have their actors really play to their natural voices. Which is remarkable for this kind of series, honestly. Because we keep calling this a shonen anime, which it is, even though it's seinen, actually. Is it? Um, yeah, it's it's actually seinen. I, I uh, don't believe that for a fucking second. I mean, I'm going by Wikipedia. Yeah, just so look up the manga wrong, description. But... It's vastly different. It makes much more sense to what he's saying. Yeah, I mean, if you if you think Nagisa has, you know, just look at her design in the manga. Um, but yeah, no, it's it, in spite of that, most shonen tend to have really exaggerated voices, and we didn't get that here, and that's really fascinating to me why they went that route i think it works perfectly i'm just interested what what made them want to make that decision so that's my thoughts okay so um this isn't a perfect show i'll say that but i think when the show i do enjoy a lot of its drop like interpersonal character drama and a lot of its big big shonen battle shit 
I think that is when the show is at its best. I do like a lot of its character moments. Those are fine, and I do enjoy a lot of its characters. But, like, a lot of the interpersonal drama, not related to uh, Ayano's mom, but I liked a lot of the personal drama and turmoil of, like, graduating and wanting to be the best, even though you feel like you're reaching your limits. That's some shonen sports shit I actually really like, and I dig quite a lot. I think this dub is really good. Like, it's not a perfect dub, but there's a lot of performances in this who I really liked and enjoyed quite a bit. It's a very interesting casting in a couple of places, with some being more than I expected. And the script and performances are all really good and really solid. I quite enjoyed my watch of this a lot more than I was expecting to, and I can't wait to watch more. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if you mm -hmm. can't wait to watch more and you're interested in seeing the dub, episodes are available on the Funimation Now service, which is up to eight at the time of recording. First two episodes are available for free, but you know, they're behind the paywall, which if you're interested in subscribing, they do have a 40-day free trial you can use to watch. Fair warning though, if you don't like the service or you don't want to continue afterwards, make sure you cancel as soon as possible since a credit card is required and they'll stop pouring money from your account. As for the sh as for the mm. show itself, it can be found on Crunchyroll as part of the Funny World Partnership. You can watch with or without a subscription. Just know, without a subscription, there'll be ads, and the latest episode will be a week behind the paywall. There's also mm. a third subscription called Verve, where if you opt for the combo pack for ten dollars a month, you get Funimation, Crunchyroll, Cartoon Hair, Over, etc., etc. Uh, and now next Splat. Which does not have double there for some reason, yeah. but hey. It has I, Legends I of the Verve, I highly, I highly recommend Verve. It's, it's fun. Yeah. It's a good service. It seems like a very and, good bang for your buck now, for sure. Yeah, and they're and they're trying to expand a lot, too, which I really appreciate. Yeah, speaking mm -hmm. of which, have so. they fixed that subtitling issue yet? Or? No idea, but I, I, know. I, I feel they, like we've I said that. I haven't noticed anything. I wish it would stop jittering. I wish they'd fix the player a little bit for that, but besides that, I have no complaints. Anyway, okay. other so. than that, if you're interested in seeing any of us the crazy shit we get up to, go ahead and plug yourselves, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Andrew, a.k.a. Classy Spartan, a.k.a. at MangaMan9000 on Twitter. You can find me over on Podcast ONA on Surreal Resolution, where I talk anime news and discussions with fellow co-host Jet. You can also find me as a moderator on the Funimation forums and Discord. I, too, am... Uh, you can find me on at Spaceman Hardy on Twitter. I, too, am a moderator on the Funimation forums and Discord. Uh, I don't really do much other than the podcast. I post a lot of goat pic. Well, I haven't been posting more goat pictures. Should I post more goat pictures? If you're listening to this episode, leave a comment below. Should Hardy post more goat pictures? <laughs> the answer hit is that, yes. Hit that it's bell! Hit yes. that bell, yes. And so, yeah, uh, just, you can follow me and listen to all my crazy ramblings about how I hate Aniplex and love Final Fantasy and, and stuff like that. So. Mm. All right. Uh, my name is Liam, a.k.a. Like the Watcher. Pretty much if you just Google Like the Watcher, you can find anything of mine on there. Uh, I'm trying to run a brand here. No. Uh, but most of the time, uh, I'm trying to work my way up to being a voice actor. I try to review old anime when I can get to it, when I'm not bogged down by real world stuff um and uh yeah you can pretty much find out what i'm up to on twitter um uh, yeah he works with um, other voice actors and actually does things with them it's cool yeah <laughs> not for a while but yeah i yeah he knows really I, cool I've, people that yeah. we know so yes <laughs> i don't know you guys seem to know a lot of people that i don't so there you go All right. uh <laughs> okay as for me, I'm a sister and for this channel. I can be found on my other channel at Jamstar1. I can be found on Twitter at Jamstar529. I do have a blog, but it's just collected dust at this point. As for the podcast itself, it can be found here on YouTube on the Dub Talk Podcast. It can also be found on Tumblr, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch by the same name. And we also have a co fi too, if you want to show your support for the podcast. The link will be in the description, so... Give us plenty of caffeine. Oh, mm. yes. No Red Bull, please. I, I can't stomach that stuff. Any final words, gentlemen, before we go? Um, Before you kill us? What? No, not like that, Lack. 
Any final words? Anybody in the mood for a lemon Danish? Fuck you, Edge. <laughs> God damn. How no. about you? Shh. Oh, God. I think we're done, gentlemen. I think this is game, set, and match. And we can oh, call it a night. Yes, yeah, so for all of us here at Dub Talk, we wish you a good night. Ed Otaku on. My shuttlecock is nice Keep and tired. Ma- <laughs> Keep it smashed. 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 Fuck you. Keep it burning. <laughs>